Honourable and respected brothers and elders, <clears throat> obviously following on from the previous news which we mentioned last week, you know, and there are different things which are coming in and about in the media. Which one thing which I wanted to talk further about that is how, what, how do we learn from this and how can we go ahead as a community and as a global community as well, not just for Muslims but also non-Muslims as well. Because we are now part of this global sort of village and everyone is sort of interlinked. It might be via online or media or something, but something there is at this moment that connects us as human beings across the globe. It was sad that after the previous, after Jumu'ah, I don't know if you heard, but in East London, someone's car got surrounded, some people, you know, attacking him again, an uh, attack, you know. This happened, uh, I think if it was more the Tower Hamlets area. And then, subhanAllah, just the night before night, just the day before yesterday, five masjids within the Aston area, half one to two in the morning, and five of them got quite badly vandalized. Windows were broken. And subhanAllah, you know, this is only going to increase. These things are only going to increase. And this is why, what it is, is that certain political or certain MPs have called for our government to recognize Islamophobia and give it a definition, which I'll come to and I'll talk about that in a bit. But what I want to talk about very, very briefly, because obviously there's only so much we can cram in, is understand that halat and conditions always befell Muslims from the beginning of time until now. Always halat and conditions have come. That's something we can never change. Always remember that. You can never expect that there won't be difficulties. Yani, it's not possible for there not at any time to be, it's not possible for there always to be good conditions, always good ahwal, always good moments. We're going to have our ups and downs. Because this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, didn't he? And I mentioned the verse last week. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test us. Money, wealth, health, children, body, and so on. So these are things, it is inevitable to happen which Allah will test us. Even if you look in, in Muslims, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sahaba, the best of all times. According to us as Muslims, it was the best era ever. And we see that even when Muslims suffered like in Uhud, 70 Sahaba became shaheed, 70, 70 of Sahaba, Allahu Akbar. You know, major, major figures in Islam. However, what happened was is that after they came back from the battle of Uhud, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did he lose hope? Did he give up? Did he feel, uh, did he throw his hands up and say, oh, this is something which I can't do? Never. He never uttered anything like this. He knew. Halat and conditions will come. Sometimes you will win, sometimes they will win. Sometimes you will be on the upper hand, sometimes you will, they will be on the upper hand. You will be on the receiving end, sometimes they will be on the receiving end. However, one thing, right, is that beyond a physical loss of the ummah, beyond a financial loss of this ummah, the biggest loss which, wallah qasam, we need to lament more than any loss, is the loss of mentality. Zahni. Zahni loss. Let me, let me just clarify what I mean by that. If somebody dies innocently, protecting their wealth, protecting their family, protecting their honor, and so on, uh, protecting them, if someone dies, protecting their money, protecting their families, and the likes. This individual will die and they will be given the status of shaheed. Okay, so there's no doubt for us as Muslim, those people who passed away were shuhada, martyrs, if you want to know the English translation. Now, the Prophet wasallam, obviously he knew that about the Ashab al-Badr, and Ashab al-Uhud, the people that suffered in Uhud. However, Sahaba, they always bounced back stronger because they were mentally strong people. Mentally strong people. Today we have lots of Muslims, but they're not mentally strong. Everything which is ghar is attractive. Everything which is outside seems attractive, meaning that they've lost their kind of legacy. Muslims have lost their legacy. And why we lament this more than physical loss? Because physical loss will be rewarded by Allah in the akhirah. But God forbid if there's a mental loss where people become despondent, people lose hope, people think that you know, Islam has finished or something along the lines like this, these individuals, they will suffer gloom in this dunya and also in the akhirah as well. Okay, so it's not all negative. But we need to stop people from thinking this particular way and understand that Islam inherently has so much khayr and so much goodness of it. And that is why Sahaba always bounce back. Look at the time of the Mongols, the Mughal, Mongols. 
They ransacked Baghdad. The Khilafat of Banu Abbas was destroyed and ransacked because of the Mongols in 1258. But yet despite that, Islam still survived. It went on to produce the likes of the Khilafat of Uthmani, the Ottoman Empire, which then went to go, and mashallah, nowadays we hear about it a lot on TV, and um, this has become a big hit. So Muslims have started to know their history more because of Ardurul Ghazi. But that was the foundations of the Uthmani Caliphate, which then lasted until 1922 4. 1924, if I'm, I'm, God forbid I should know this, but either 1922, 1924, in, 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 that, in the 1920s. Now this is the thing, that was the longest surviving Islamic dynasty ruling power that ever had existed. It came after the ransack of the, Bong, of, of the Mongols. It came after that. You see, that's when the real power kicked in. They didn't lose hope. At the time of Mongols, you had scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah, and you have other, other big scholars within the Ummah. People never lost hope. They always bounced back because their mentality was deen. Their thinking was deen. Their perception of everything was Islam. When they used to do dunya, it was with the bigger picture for serving the deen. When they educated, it was with the bigger picture of serving the deen. We don't have that anymore. That's what we don't have. That's what we're lamenting more than anything else. It's the mental loss of the Ummah. The mental loss of this Ummah. Whereas we were those people that were sent as guidance. We're supposed to be role models and examples for others to follow. We are now in need of guidance. We are now those people that are in need of guidance. Whereas before, the Islamic seminaries, the Islamic institutions, they served as forward thinking in science, agriculture, economics, subhanAllah, all manners, and these are just some I've mentioned and enumerated, all manners of, of education, they were the forefront of this. And Muslims were always at the forefront of their game. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't, we don't look at it like this anymore. And we're kind of, this is the legacy which we've lost. It's like we're so stuck within our just our little sphere of just earning money. The bigger picture to serve mankind, serve humanity, to forward education, forward knowledge, that's non-existent. It always boils down to how much money a person has. This mentality we need to break out of. We need to break out of that mentality and rather think to ourselves as, as, as wider, bigger, contributing people for the benefit of, of humanity. And once Muslims can break free from that, by Allah, I swear that there's so much khair that can come about. But nevertheless, what I find is that after hearing some news reports, and that was the first thing which I want to say, and I want to mention something else, and subhanAllah, wow, I'm really impressed about how some of the people in New Zealand have responded to these particular attacks in Christchurch, especially, especially the Prime Minister, you know, that Jacinda Ardern, if that's her name, if I pronounced it right. She's, only, she's quite young, she's one of the very the youngest women who have uh, you know, uh, served as that particular cabinet. And she, a massive achievement. You know, she's only 38 years old and she's the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Uh, putting her credentials to the side, the point I'm mentioning is that SubhanAllah, did you ever hear of someone condemning it the way she did? Where, where, was that? where were our kings, of our, where the rulers of our Muslim countries, where were they? The only two people that you can say gave a semi sort of response, one was Imran Khan and the second was Erdogan. Only two people who gave some sort, of, some sort of decent response. Erdogan, at least the Turkish media were at the forefront. They were mentioning a lot of things and subhanAllah there was like open du'as and, and so on. SubhanAllah, where is the rest of the world? Where is the rest of the Muslim world? When the Charlie Hebdo thing happened in France, which again, wallahi Muslims, listen to this very carefully. I'm mentioning Charlie Hebdo, but I just want to add something. We do not support any act of terrorism which kills an innocent person. When that thing happened in France, Charlie Hebdo, when the, they, sh they shot that particular, what's his name, that, uh, the, the, the news, the, what's the guy? The, sorry? Is it cartoonist? Yeah, cartoonist. That's the one, like a cartoonist, and he was, he, was, he, was, he was making satire, wasn't he, about Islam. So anyway, what happened was they killed that individual, they opened fire on the office, and they did some, they just, nevertheless, a terrorist attack was done in the name of religion and, and to hurt people. Now what happened is, the issue with this, we said clearly, openly, we condemned it. This is wrong in Islam. Okay, it's wrong in Islam. We completely had, there's no space for this in the religion whatsoever. However, the sad reality is, when this happened, Mahmoud Abbas, people, you know, prominent Arab figures, Muslim countries, they were there, holding, locking arms side by side. Again, like for example, now the French Prime Minister, Italian, all Prime Ministers were holding, did you see that? They were all locking to show solidarity. Muslims as well. Where were the Muslims when this happened? Where is the Muslims that speak out? They're not in existence. 
all just, they, they don't say nothing, subhanAllah. And then what it is, is that we have a haq to speak what is right. This is, this is no one's miras that they can only, we, we have a haq to speak what is right. But it's unfortunate because Muslims don't have no representation. We're not like the Catholic Church where everything leads up to the hierarchy to the Pope. We don't have that. We don't have that. We don't have a, a, a figure that speaks on behalf of the Muslims. And this is what's frustrating. The most we have are certain leaders around the world. And subhanAllah, most of them, they, okay, you heard a few things, some condemnation here, OIC, very gamzor, Saudi, even worse than that. But where's the real condemnation? Where is this, you know, the best response? One of the best responses came from New Zealand Prime Minister herself. And this is why I'm mentioning this. Simple. I respect the fact that she stood up and she, or oh, subhanAllah, and she, the way she handled and managed the situation was, you know, in, in, if anything, I would say I'm very, very thankful for this particular gesture. And as Muslims, subhanAllah, we, you know, as a whole, we should be very sympathetic and very, subhanAllah, thankful that at least someone was open to declare it as an act of terrorism and be open about it and say this was wrong. And subhanAllah, how they showed solidarity, ajeeb, Allahu Akbar, absolutely speechless. And then it makes you think that, you know, there's a lot more news which is coming out. Obviously, there's a lot more things that the, slowly, slowly, you know, bodies are being released, janazas are, are about to be being performed. They had a vigil, they had an adhan, you know, and they were like, we're standing with, like, with you because you're our citizens. We stand together with you in this time of need. What I want to add and what I want to mention, has not the time come that we also think to ourselves, right, that Islamophobia in UK is also rising? This is why Sayyidah Varsi and so on, I'm not, I'm not a political dude, right? But reality is that obviously we have to keep afloat with these things because this is our country, we also care about it. Sayyidah Varsi, right, in 2000, and it was, I think, when was it? I haven't got the exact mention, but she mentioned that the, the issue within the Islamophobia, especially within the Tories, she referred to it as the failure on Islamophobia is desperately disappointing. These were her exact words. The failure of Islamophobia in the Tories is desperately disappointing. And the MCB actually called for a report and they said we want an independent review into the conservatives of Islamophobia which has become rife. Because if you look at Zach Goldsmith, the mayoral candidate, he actually called Sadiq, Sadiq Khan a terrorist sympathizer. You know what I mean? So you have these sort of like, is, these elements of Islamophobia even within the conservatives. At least, fair enough, you know, they've, they've been able to f define or accept definitions of anti-Semitism and so on. And good if they have, alhamdulillah. But as Muslims living in UK, we are also thinking along the same lines, that if the definition of Islamophobia were to be, to, to be at least defined, which I should also add, Labour and Liberal Democrats have come forward, L Labour recognised one, and Liberal Democrats have also jumped on to say we also accept a definition of Islamophobia, Islamophobia. Where are the Conservatives, the government which is in power? And that's what we're, we're calling for. But let me make this very clear. They ha it's, at this moment, conservatives haven't recognized it as of today, which is what's, what's the date today? Just in case this goes out, Friday the 22nd of March. Up until now, I haven't heard of anything they've accepted so far. 2019 today. If it changes later on, then obviously then consider this to retract, uh, uh, correct that state, this statement. But up until now, nothing has happened. And why is it a concern for us? Because there are certain reports, right, that are claiming that there are, it is an increase of hate crime which is on the rise. As I mentioned in Birmingham, our five masjids vandalized in the Aston area, literally like stone throws away from each other. You see the map of where they got attacked. And there are a post, obviously, last week, some people have experienced certain, you know, hate crimes against them, whether it be verbal, verbal someone spat out, someone's hijab getting pulled off. This has unfortunately become the norm. And women are more targeted than men. The, the statistics show women are more targeted than men. But in, basically, there was a report which had been done by a certain newspapers, Guardian, Independent, and so on. They said that a 26% rise from 2016, from 2016, imagine, to 17, there was a 26% increase and, and rise in Islamophobic sort of attacks. And, and, but then a bigger alarming figure than that was the independent mention that in 2000, from, this was specifically in 16th of October 2018, this is their report. They said that there's a 40% increase on race related hate crimes. So hate crimes have gone up by how much? Approximately 40%. They had a figure and they said a total of 94,000 hate crime incidents. 94,000, that's not a joke. And they claim that the majority of these have been against Muslims. It makes me think that, obviously, we're part and parcel of the society as well. 
Yeah, look, I'm gonna be, look, don't we also have a fringe element amongst Muslims? We're not going to sit here and say we don't. We do. Because unfortunately, yeah, a news report from America have said and claimed, I haven't read the res I haven't gone to the source, but I'm basing it on what they've said. They've claimed that certain IS so-called Islamic State spokesmen have said that we're going to get, we're going to make a retaliation on this. By you can't, so who are you going to target? Tell me, who are you going to target? What innocent people from New Zealand? New Zealand that's haram. And it's not even for us to tarnish the whole of people because the, you, you've seen the solidarity New Zealanders are showing, New Zealanders are showing with the Muslims. So we, we can't even say that that's everyone, that's one person. And it would be wrong to bring his faith into it and say, well, it's a Christian problem. Just as how it's not fair to say it's an Islamic problem. It's not fair for us, and this is what we're, we're arguing for, is that it's not fair for us to be brandish or branded. Why? Then we can't brand it. We, we call not to brand others. We shouldn't be branded ourselves. You know? And this is the issue which I'm saying going forward as a, as a government, as a country, our government needs to also call for this, a recognition of Islamophobia, what it is, and protect the wider citizens. But nevertheless, right, alhamdulillah, at least Jalla, it's like Labour have gone and done something along these lines, you know, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for this effort, you know, and may good come out of this, because I believe that there needs to be more mutual discussion and mutual understanding, which leads me to my final point. At this moment in time, we can't help but there being a very sort of, you can say, an anti-immigration sentiment wherever we go at this moment, because Brexit is still on the sort of verge, on the edge. People don't know whether they're coming or going, and unfortunately, this whole thing of immigration had fueled the, thing, the feeling of Brexit. Okay, and other things as well, sort of laws being implemented in European, and then there was a slogan, we want our country back, and so on. So these things of having this idea of a foreign power taking over us, we're not in control of our own borders, this has given rise to a lot of anti-immigration, anti-sort of other sort of sentiment. So nevertheless, what it is, is that I say, if the government aren't going to be too quick on calling a definition and so on, what stops us as Muslims at this moment opening our doors and having open days? Baisab, do you understand where I'm coming from? You know, like subhanAllah, in, in New Zealand now they've had open days where non-Muslims have gone. Non-Muslims have gone and it gives them a chance to meet the Muslim community. I'm telling you, there are so many people that go past the mosque and they must think as well, what happens here? What goes on here? What do they talk about here? What do they preach here? What does it look like inside? These are thoughts perhaps non-Muslims have. This is a golden opportunity right now. And I'm saying, if, 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 if anyone listened to this, share this. Share this. And even you guys as well, share these things and concerns with others. We need to be open more in regards to our masajid with rules and regulations. Of course, we don't want to turn the masjid into a fairground. But for the, the Prophet wasallam welcomed outside delegations to the house of Allah. Didn't he or did he not? He, wel he welcomed non-Muslims, mushrikeen, Allahu Akbar, people that didn't even worship Allah. And this is exactly how we need to think, that if we see ourselves as part and parcel of this society, well, sharing of the understanding and the mutual respect of our faith is something which is inherently, which is important and part of our necessity of living in UK. So this is why I'm saying that as, as Muslims, and maybe inshallah you can take this back to your own communities as well and, and, and own masajid, and mention the importance of this, that now is a good opportunity for us to kind of break down those sort of stiff barriers we've got and have more open days. Have sort of more include, you know, visit my mosque initiative, for example. Have you guys heard of this initiative? Yeah, mashallah, it's a good initiative because then people come and they were saying, I wasn't sure what to expect. You know, I, I had negative impressions about what happened in the mosque and who was there going to be. I had a friend, subhanAllah, minister, a Christian minister, and, and we were working together for a number of years, and he wanted to go and visit a masjid for Jumu'ah. So he, I said to him, uh, you know, from the Croydon area, you, would you like to go and visit Croydon? Because he you know, doesn't live too far. So he said, yeah, if you can arrange it for me, I'd love to go. So I, I facilitated and I phoned the Imam and I said, he's a colleague of mine. He's going to sit, attend the lecture, attend the Jumu'ah. And he said, by all means, it'd be a pleasure. So they arranged for him to go. And then when we caught up the week later, I asked him, what, how did you benefit? What did you see? What did you learn from that? He said, I was so impressed. First of all, because obviously he had Muslim colleagues, we used to talk about faith quite a lot. But he said, I didn't know that, you know, how you guys kind of, in congregation how you pray and then there was the speech the imam spoke so eloquently according to the needs of the people it wasn't too academic wasn't too soft it was and he only had praise to say and i thought subhanallah if that's a minister of religion and he's got a lack of understanding of faith how about the average joe blogs who just lives on the street and doesn't have nothing to do with anyone 
But these are the average public. And we'll, listen, we need to work. If, you're, if, you be, if you don't want to be part of British culture, then don't. It's fine. But I look at myself, look, I'm half English. We're not going nowhere. I'm third generation here now. I'm, I can't see myself living in Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, you know, Morocco, Syria, Egypt. Brother, I'm, I'm born and bred here. I look at this as my home. This is my home. I'm just a half Muslim, I'm a half Pakistani, English, mixed race person, but I'm a Muslim. That doesn't mean I don't care about the society. So for me, I think this initiative is good to go forward. O open up our masjids, have open days, da'wah. And you know, introduce people, this is our faith, this is what we do, this is how we pray, this is what we talk about, a common understanding, subhanAllah. And that's how I think this is an amazing time to do this right now. Because people, mashallah, New Zealand have shown, the people have been open to accept it. And alhamdulillah, why not? Use this as an initiative to break down those barriers. If our government's not going to be too quick to recognize Islamophobia and to give it a definition, well, fine then. Until you decide, well, let's work on the local public. And say, look, we're not trying to take over anything, but we just want a, a common ground. Come and let's have a cup of tea and have a discussion. We want to show you our masjid and then we'll open it for Q&A. Because there are certain things as a society which we do different to perhaps the wider community. For example, I know that there are certain practices, there are certain things, certain dress, certain ways of doing things. Our Ramadan is coming up. Why not use Ramadan as a good initiative? Call people for iftari, observe our iftari, partake in our food, sit for the taraweeh. But anyway, these, like I said, these are recommendations. Mashallah, this is a fard -e kifaya Wallahi, I've taken my fard -e kifaya and put it onto you. We haven't got the take for the whole ummah. We have to ignite, ignite these thinking and these feelings amongst our community so they go to others and also bring about this muhim and this importance to make in our communities. If you don't, if you look here, I'm going to just milk the system. Ten years, I'm going to go back to where I come from. Then, then, then this bayan doesn't mean nothing to you. But for those of us, and I say us, who are part of this society, and I regard myself firstly as British, before another culture. I'm Muslim, that I'm, Muslim is part of my blood. You can't separate from that from me, wherever you do, but wherever I go in the world, I identify as being a British Muslim. So my culture in terms of here in England, it doesn't mean that I, my faith is number one, that's, that's part of my whole way of life. That's inseparable. But nevertheless, we want good for the society, and I believe this is a great initiative way forward. As they've had these open days, invited people, can we not do the same? Will we not do the same? I hope and pray we do do the same, inshallah. May Allah give us tawfiq and the ability. Some things have been left, but khair, enough has been said. May Allah inspire us and give us the ability to take a positive message unto others and make mutual love and muhabba amongst everyone, inshallah. Allah give us the ability.